thank you all for coming out tonight. We, uh, as often happens, we were in a closed session, so we've already opened the meeting. Uh, there are no board president superintendent comments for tonight, so I think we're going to start off by asking Mrs. Smith to introduce the uh, final form of the program review presentation. Good evening. It's my it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Mr. Robert Morrison, who, on behalf of the New Jersey Arts Education Partnership, who conducted the external program review for the Fine and Performing Arts Program Review. Just to review the processes, um, program reviews are something that the district undertakes yearly in a variety of areas, and the process is that we um, develop an RFP, a request for proposal, um, to go for some external consultants to be able to come in and give us a set of eyes of looking at whatever program is going to be reviewed. And simultaneously, we convene an internal team of stakeholders in that area, and they um, separately develop a report so that we end up with two different reports, an external report and an internal report on that area. After Mr. Uh, Robert Morrison presents the external report, Mr. Jeff Santoro, the Supervisor of Fine and Performing Arts, will present on behalf of the internal committee. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, members of the board. Um, oops. Is that working now? Yep. Uh, members of the board, Dr. Aderhall, uh, members of the community, uh, on behalf of the New Jersey Arts Education Partnership, it's my uh, pleasure to be here with you this evening to present to you the findings of the external review of the West Windsor Plainsboro Regional Public Schools Visual and Performing Arts Program. Um, just to set some context for this evening about the program review, uh, the program review was conducted during the 2015-2016 school year. Uh, site visitations were conducted along with uh, administration, faculty interviews, and more than 2,000 surveys of faculty, students, and parents and community members. Additional data was reviewed from the New Jersey Department of Education School Performance Report Reports the certificated uh, staff file from the Department of Education and information from the 2016 New Jersey Arts Education Census, which is a five-year census that is, uh, occurs for all of the 2,400 public school buildings here in the state of New Jersey. Uh, we also reviewed program of studies from the 27 either peer or J districts uh, that are part of your configuration. Uh, the comparisons to peer and J districts were also uh, conducted with the data sources that I had listed previously. Now, one of the things that we often say is in order to get to where you want to go, you have to know where you are. And part of this program review is really to help level set where is the program today so that you can create a pathway forward, a roadmap to where you want to go with the program. So, where Arts education is here in the district. Uh, music and visual art programs, which are the two disciplines that you offer, are certainly recognized as being very good. The vision of providing every child with opportunities in the arts is obvious throughout the district in all the schools that we visited uh, for the two arts disciplines that are currently, or that were currently available uh, at the time of the review. And while there are challenges that presented themselves to the review team, the findings do not represent issues of a deficient program. So I want to be clear that we were, were coming in here and identifying significant deficiencies in the program offerings, but what we are laying forward for you is the idea of how you can go from good to great. How do you build on the, the good foundation that you already have here, particularly as it relates to visual and, and performing arts, uh, or music and visual arts and take that further to provide uh, greater opportunities for your students. One of my favorite quotes actually came from uh, one of our administrative leaders who said, I like the way that this district has fostered a love of arts within our students. And that was really apparent to us as we did our site visitations. Uh, we went into individual classrooms to see students creating art. We saw the unique approaches that many of the teachers took. We saw them operating sometimes in less than ideal circumstances uh, with uh, you know, class sizes uh, that many educators would be uh, uh, less than excited to be handling at the time. 
but the arts teachers handled it with great flair in what they were doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through some, some snapshots of each of the sections of the folks that we spoke to, walk quickly through some of the data from the comparison districts that we looked at, uh, and then provide you with the recommendations that we have. Uh, in the, from the faculty, there were several things that the faculty cited as being things that were very important to them, things that they truly valued. Uh, that included the fact that they had motivated students. They came in every day, they had motivated students that wanted to learn that there was tremendous support from the parents in the community for the program, that there was support from their building principals that they worked with, and that they also had support from the administration. In the areas that they identified as things that they would want to see improve, the two areas that jumped out were uh, the fact that they felt that they didn't have any real input on the budget process. Uh, and that they felt that they also didn't have any real input into what was happening within the school itself. And we'll hit on that a little bit more as we move forward. One of the things that we asked all the constituents that we talked to, talked with, was to identify for us the three things that they value that shouldn't change. And then we also asked them, what are the three things that you would change immediately if it were up to you? And these were unprompted, so it was, we didn't give them any prompts. It was, in their opinion, what did they think the, the items would be. Uh, under faculty, the things that they valued were the facilities, uh, particularly the fact that most of the arts faculty had their own rooms, so that you didn't have art on a cart like you would see in some school districts, that there was flexibility to the schedule. Uh, they all valued the pull-out lesson program, the ability to spend that time training one-on-one -on -one or in, in small groups of uh, the instrumental lesson programs. And to a teacher, they valued their colleagues. They all valued the colleagues that they worked with and actually wished that they had more time to interact with their colleagues in areas of professional development. Uh, in the areas of what they would like to see improved, uh, an increased budget, more and improved space. As I mentioned, there are some places where they are operating in less than ideal circumstances uh, in areas where they, the, because the student loads are so great uh, that they have challenges uh, at, at times being able to handle them, uh, which then ties into the idea of more staffing. Uh, we'll see in a little bit uh, trying to level out the student teacher loads uh, within the district to provide maybe better opportunities for instruction. Uh, and the, the last item was more opportunities to provide input. They, there was really a sense that they have uh, something to contribute to the process of budgeting and planning and that they're looking for an opportunity to have their voices be heard. Uh, when it comes to the students, we looked at them, we asked the students to ple please rate their music program and a, uh, here you see that 47% of the students rated the music program as excellent, or a combination of the two, both excellent and good, gives you a total of 84% uh, in the top category on the music program. Uh, when we looked at the visual art program, uh, it was 80% combined in the top two categories, although you see that there were more on the good side than there were on the excellent side as it related to the visual art program. Uh, in the area of the, the we asked them about the, the importance of arts involvement to them. What was important to them as it related to arts involvement? Uh, and fun was the number one issue that came up. You know, students enjoy going to their arts class. And, and I think that's something actually to be celebrated, to have something in the school that students look forward to so that they can participate in. They all talked about, or the majority of them talked about, the importance of the teacher. That it was the teacher that inspired them, the teacher that made that classroom a safe place, a welcoming environment for them to, to be successful. The other area that was really a, a high point for the students, uh, and it came up in some of their unprompted responses later on, was that they valued the opportunity to express themselves. The opportunity to be outside of, of the normal classroom environment, to be in a place where they could, through their own creative initiative, through their own arts discipline, be able to express how they feel. Uh, that it's an opportunity to develop their creative abilities, and that for many of them, they enjoyed the opportunity to work with others 
in the process of creating something, whether that was a work of art or a piece of music or creating a performance of some sort. Um, I, I think this next comment by one of the students really encapsulates the feeling that the arts are a way of expanding areas of the mind not usually touched upon in other subjects and a way of learning responsibility, the rewards of hard work through practice and seeing the fruits of teamwork, cooperation between 50 plus students. I think that really kind of sums up uh, from the student standpoint their feeling about the programs. So when we ask them again, there's that unprompted question, what do you value? Uh, first, the number one thing that, they, that came up unprompted was the teaching faculty. Uh, again, the, the faculty creating that safe space. space. The second area which we hit on, self-expression. Uh, the third point they hit on was the quality of the program, that they were held to high standards, uh, that it wasn't just somewhere that they were going to just spend a little bit of time, but there was an expectation of them to grow and reach and strive for something better. Uh, the lesson program, and then the last item that, that was on the list was the trips. Uh, they love taking trips, particularly the, the ones that go over to Europe every three years. Uh, they certainly uh, uh, enjoy talking about that. In the areas of improvement, they wanted to see instruction and faculty, meaning more opportunities and maybe more balance uh, within some of the course or class sizes. Uh, more course variety. Uh, provide uh, additional opportunities for them, uh, particularly in some of the areas uh, that were not present at the district at the time, in the areas of theater and dance. Um, they asked for weighted courses. Several of them mentioned the fact that they, they found themselves uh, oftentimes conflicted about having to make the choice about being involved in an honors course or an arts course. In essence, having to choose between their passion and their GPA. And I certainly recognize that there are discussions here with this district about how you handle issues around grade weighting and GPA, uh, but at least from the feedback of this particular program evaluation, uh, as long as you have weighted opportunities, certainly the arts should be considered um, in an appropriate fashion along with that. And then the last area was certainly improved funding uh, to support the programs here um, in the district. When we got to the parents, uh, we asked them to, again, rate the overall visual and performing arts experience for your students. And what's important to understand here is the students, or the parents that we interviewed represented 1,300 students. So some of them had multiple students in the district at varying levels. Uh, so I think we had somewhere a little bit, a little more than 850 parents responded. But those 850 parents actually represented 1,350 students. So a significant response from the community. 37% uh, rating the program as good, 33% as excellent, 70% combined uh, in the value there. But what was interesting was when you begin to look at it based on school configuration type. Because we started to see a little bit of a of a variance when it came to what high school and middle school parents thought versus what elementary school parents thought. And here on this particular chart, you'll see that uh, a plurality of high school and middle school parents actually rated the programs as excellent versus the elementary schools who parents who a plurality rated them as good. Uh, so I think there's something uh, to take note of about you know, what might be going on at the elementary level where, the, where there is this um, differential between the elementary parents and the parents in the other school configurations. And we, when we look at the issue of adequately challenged, or, you know, are your students adequately challenged by school type? And also, is there enough program choice by school type? Uh, again, we start to see a little bit of that same pattern uh, develop where you'll see that elementary school parents would like to see more challenging content uh, at a greater level than in the other areas. And when we talk about enough program choice, actually a plurality of the elementary school parents actually want to see more program choices than the other categories. So to us that was an interesting finding when you started to look at information from the elementary schools versus uh, the other schools. Uh, when we ask the parents again, what do you value? What do you value in these programs? Again, great faculty. 
Every group that we talked to, faculty was in the top three items of unprompted responses. Um, they valued the fact that, that arts are required here in the district. Uh, and that there's you know, near 100% involvement in students at both the elementary and through the middle school level. Uh, they valued the performances and the ex ex exhibitions. They loved coming into the building to see their students perform. They loved coming in to see their students' artwork and actually would like to see more of those opportunities. Uh, they valued the course, the, the course offerings and the quality of the offerings that are here. And they also valued the lesson program that they were able to get for their students by participating here in the district. In the area of what should improve, they talked about courses including theater and dance. Uh, obviously, we have music and art here. Uh, at the time of our review, theater and dance were not present in the program. Uh, they wanted to see more funding to support uh, both the current programs and the expansion into new programs. Uh, they wanted to see uh, uh, some improvements into scheduling to address some of the scheduling challenges that, that may exist. And I understand the challenges of scheduling a high school and a middle school uh, in this day and age with all of the competing priorities that exist. Uh, but that was something that they were, uh, were, were commenting on. Uh, and they want to see more showcases. They want to see have the students take more field trips. They want to have assembly programs. They want to see more engagement with the rich cultural diversity that we have in the general area, whether you go down to Princeton or you go south on, on, on the turnpike to Philadelphia or north up to New York City, the fact that there are great opportunities, they wanted to take advantage of it. But the, the one thing that many of them said, and an overriding tone or concern in the survey responses, was they wanted to make sure that they were heard that you do not do anything to weaken the program. I do not know how there was a perception that this process would lead to a weakening of the program, but there was some fear that that would be the result. And so I just wanted to make sure that uh, because of the, the, the level of anxiety that we read into this and, and, and the often, uh, you know, as often as it came up, that we wanted to make that point clear. Uh, and I can assure you there's been nothing in our evaluation or interviews that would lead us to that conclusion whatsoever. Um, one of the things that I wanted to show you as it relates to comparison districts. Right here we're looking at uh, what has been your self-identified peer group. Uh, so these are the peer group of uh, districts that you compare yourself to. Uh, and what's, what I'm showing you here is both the presence of program and volume of students that are involved. And so you can see very quickly that all your peer groups have music and visual art. You can see most of them have theater, and you can see about half of them have dance, okay, just as a point of reference. Now, in total art students, West Windsor Plainsboro has the largest total student enrollment in the arts of your peer group. Not surprising because you also have the largest student population um, in your peer group. Uh, visual art, though, there was, uh, I think Bridgewater was uh, a, a little bit ahead of you uh, in that area. Um, but again, because of the size of the district, uh, you're, you're going to have greater enrollment. So we don't tend to look at just raw enrollment numbers as a, as a measuring stick. We begin to look at percentage of enrollment. And the next few slides that I'm going to take you through are what we refer to as the killer data points in the area of arts education. These are the data points that when we look at arts education programs across the nation, when we look at them here in New Jersey uh, and in other states, these are the three main points that we look to from a quantitative standpoint that provide us some insight into quality of the program. The first one we're going to look at is a metric we call per pupil arts spending. And what this is, this is a measure of the, 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 the a budget that's allocated to curricular support. It does not include teacher salaries. It does not include capital expenditures. It is really to isolate what is the allocation to support the curriculum on a year-over-year -year basis. And then we take that number and divide it by the number of students in the district. And that gives us a per-pupil uh, arts measure. And here you can see, uh, again, compared to your peer districts, self-identified peer districts, uh, the 80 percent of the student, or uh, I'm sorry, that 80 percent of, uh, this is the wrong slide, my apologies. This is actually the percentage of students enrolled. 
The percentage of students enrolled here shows that 80% of the students in West Windsor Plainsboro are enrolled in arts education. You're kind of in the middle of the pack uh, because you'll see that you know to either side of you, you're 80%, 81, 83, 79 below. Then you have some of your other districts on the higher end, the upper 80s, low 90s, and then it drops off to, on the other side, 68, 66, uh, and 63. So you're at 80%. State average, by the way, is 74. So again, when we're talking about your peer districts, we're talking about some of the more affluent districts, some of the more well-supported districts. So here, you're at 80%, but the state average is 74%. When we look at the per pupil art spending, the metric I was describing before, uh, here you'll see that when we compare uh, West Windsor to the state average in blue, the peer average in green, and the J district average in yellow, that West Windsor Play Plainsboro on, in every category, elementary, middle, high, and total, uh, has a lower per pupil art spending uh, measure than any of the other categories, even lower than the state average. Um, so that's something to consider now. A couple of factors that play into that. You, you only have two of the four arts disciplines, so you're not spending necessarily on all four arts disciplines. So that's something to, to keep in, in mind uh, when you look at this moving forward. But it does speak to the, the need for potentially additional investment into the program. When we look at the student arts teacher ratio, this is a measure where we look at the number of arts teachers divided by the student population within the district, and we look at it at the individual school levels. Um, and again, comparing them to the state, here, J district, and then West Windsor, Plainsboro. Uh, in this particular metric, the lower number is a better number than the higher number. Okay? So higher number means there's a greater, greater uh, uh, student-teacher ratio. And here you say, see that across both elementary, high school, and total, West Windsor has at a higher level. Uh, in the, the one area in middle school, you see that you're actually uh, more favorable in the student arts teacher ratio. And then we slice this a little bit thinner to get to teacher load. Because this now we're going to look at the actual arts student teacher ratio. So these are the students that are actually enrolled in arts courses uh, to the arts teachers that you have. Again, looking at the same levels, and you'll see that you have a higher level of student arts teacher ratio, a less preferable level of student arts teacher ratio than uh, the state, the peers, or the J districts. Okay, so these are the three, three killer data points that we look at. Per pupil arts spending, student arts teacher ratio, percentage of students involved. And those are the measures that we can look at to give us some inference of where things are and where might there be some opportunities. Student teacher load does not surprise us whatsoever from what we saw coming into the district because the good news is you have a tremendous number of students that are involved in the programs. That's a good thing. Uh, but if they're being handled by a smaller teaching faculty, that may be necessary to do justice to the program. So that's something to take in mind. The last item before we go into recommendations are the comparison of uh, the arts programs, and this is actually, we're looking at cultural organization participation. So here, you see again your, your peer groups, and you'll see field trips is on all the way to the left, assembly programs, artists and residencies, and partnerships. So that's the way that it moves across. Everything that's in solid blue means that all the schools in that district have field trips or the particular intervention. Everything that's dark orange means that intervention does not exist in the district. West Windsor Plainsboro is all the way down at the bottom. You see that some of your schools have field trips. Some of your schools have assemblies, actually less than half of those schools. None of your schools are involved in artists and residency programs, and none of your schools have multi-year partnerships with cultural organizations. So this just gives you a frame of reference to look at how do we engage with the resources that we have here in our community or surrounding area to further amplify what's happening with the arts education programs that we are providing within our schools. So lastly, what I'm going to leave you with is the handful of recommendations uh, that summarize the work. There's much more information in the 98-page detailed report that we provided to you, including about uh, 25 pages of student comments 
that we found to be very valuable and interesting. There's, there's always something valuable about hearing from the students about what they value. So I would encourage you uh, to read through the entire report. But here are the recommendations. First is to update the curriculum to align to the 2017 New Jersey Student Learning Standards in the Visual and Performing Arts. This new student learning standards are to go before the board for their first read, uh, I believe in May, and that they will be uh, approved in September uh, as official standards. So the timing of this to begin that work uh, certainly comes into place. And along with that alignment, certainly would be to develop and implement dance and theater curriculum, as well as to look at expanded course offerings. One of the comments that we had was, when you go into a, an arts classroom, uh, in the district. Does it look any different than an arts classroom or a music room would look 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago? And I think that's a valid question to ask. Is there anything that's different being done today differently than maybe it was being done 25 or 30 years ago? Are the course offerings any different than maybe what was done 25, 30 years ago? And I think that's a very valid uh, question to look at and I think something that the standards review will, will help you with. Uh, to increase the diversity uh, 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 and the number of course offerings uh, in, in the district. Uh, to explore creative scheduling solutions. Uh, see what type of opportunities there are uh, for different scheduling solutions to uh, address student uh, participation. Uh, and consider adding grade weighting if you're going to maintain some sort of grade weighting policy. Uh, obviously, if at some point in time in the future you don't have grade weighting, this would not be necessary. Um, in the area of resources, uh, increase the visual and performing arts faculty. Uh, by most any metric, you're understaffed. Uh, and I think that the ability to both expand the program into dance and theater is going to require staffing in order to increase other opportunities in music and visual art is going to lead to increased staffing. Uh, increased budget and funding to support that as it relates to both faculty and curricular support, um, as well as um, revising uh, budget management. One of the things that they talked about was the inability for, for the, uh, there to be really vertically integrated budgeting from the standpoint that there was uh, budgeting being handled uh, through uh, the schools but in coordination uh, at the district level so that there could be efficiencies across the district in how arts education spending was allocated and utilized um, in the schools. Uh, improved technology implementation and training. The teachers were definitely uh, very interested not only in, in more technology and being able to use the technology that they have, but to have training on it. Uh, oftentimes we see a lot of districts investing in the technology, but not so much in the training. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case here, but from the arts teachers, what we did here is they do want additional training on how to use technology in an appropriate way uh, in their particular disciplines. Um, and improve facilities. Uh, I'm sure this is not a surprise to any of you. Uh, when you go into any of the schools and you see ensembles that have upwards of 200 kids, on a cafe gymatorium uh, at one of the elementary schools. Cafe gymatorium. Right? Cafe gymatorium. We all have those. Um, there's an opportunity there when ensembles can't fit in the rooms that they are outfitted for, uh, where instrument storage is in hallways. I mean, there are, there are obviously opportunities that are visible just by walking through the buildings, recognizing that, I, that, that uh, there are other, there are other um, initiatives that are going on in the district that will drive some of those decisions. But as you have opportunities to improve facilities, improving the facilities for the visual performing arts programs, um, I think will be an important place to go. And the last area is community. Um, develop effective communications with the community about the visual and performing arts program. Why do you have it? What's the value? Why is it that it's so important to this district and to your students to be involved in the visual and performing arts? I know you talk about uh, the importance of 21st century learning skills, uh, and there's a very important connection between 21st century learning skills and the arts, and creativity, and innovation. So use that every opportunity that you have to communicate to uh, the, the parents and the other community members 
the connection between the arts and the other learning objectives that you have here at the district, uh, because I think that would be an important point, and it's something that the parents really reflected back to us. Uh, make connections to the cultural resources that you have, uh, both in the nearby community, whether it's Princeton, uh, great resources down in Philadelphia, great resources out of New York, lots of organizations that can bring uh, a, appropriate content into the schools, particularly for your elementary schools, uh, certainly an opportunity to take advantage of something to enliven um, arts education for the students and even make connection through the arts to other learning objectives. So, and, and these cultural organizations do a very good job of doing that. And the last item is, uh, because we didn't have anywhere else to put it, was to add music and arts honor societies uh, to the high schools, uh, both north and south. Um, both music and visual art have honor societies, as does dance and theater, thespians on the, on the theater side. So as you increase or add theater uh, and, and add that at the high school level, the ability to provide the best and brightest students the opportunity to um, be recognized for their commitment to the arts and then also use that commitment to give back to the community through the arts is an important opportunity uh, for your students that we think that they should have. So with that, I will conclude my remarks, and I will answer any questions that you may have. I have a question. Uh, for the board. No, for the board. Uh, for members of the board. Yes, ma'am. Um, in terms of updating the curriculum to align with the 2017 state learning standards and visual and performing arts, is that a big change, a little change? Like, what, how, is, how are these new standards different? Well, I, I, will, I will touch on it a little bit, and then I'll defer to Jeff. I think that he can elaborate a little bit further because he was involved in one of the standards writing teams. Uh, but one of the things that uh, is different was we, in the state of New Jersey, they actually reviewed our current learning standards with the new national standards for arts education that were released in 2014 and, and looked at what were the things that were um, valuable about the, the, the new standards and how they may apply to New Jersey and what may be uh, different that either we want to embrace or that maybe we don't want to take on because it's not appropriate to our state. Uh, there was a certain banding of uh, certain artistic disciplines and changes, particularly at the high school level, uh, that provided greater, I think, more valuable input for uh, educators when they're crafting curriculum. Uh, that existed before. Uh, one of the things that the state did not do that the national standards themselves did do is they had grade level standards in the national standards. And here in the state of New Jersey, our standards are by grade band. And, and it's that way across all the standards and we've had a, a history of doing it that way. So in New Jersey, they decided that we would not go to grade level standards, that we would keep the grade band standards uh, in place and modify the national standards uh, to fit within that particular format. So um, I'll defer to Jeff to speak to that more in, in more detail when he does his presentation. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you for the uh, comprehensive presentation. Yeah, uh, one quick clarification, maybe for the audience. Could you clarify what is J or yeah. peer school districts? Oh, my apologies. Um, so J districts are um, are districts that have been, were, were established by a formula that was uh, created and updated, I believe last time it was updated was in 2000, where they, they looked at different uh, economic, demographic, uh, and educational statistics for individual districts and then put them into groupings. And the groupings went from A and B and then you had uh, D, E, and F, and G, uh, all the way up to J. J districts are the most affluent districts in the state of New Jersey. So when we're comparing West Windsor Plainsboro, which is a J district, to all the other J districts, uh, what we're doing is we're comparing all of the most affluent school districts together in the same metric. So those are that's based on an item called a district factor group. Uh, the peer districts were a, a set of districts that were established, uh, I believe, by the administration or by the board to say, when we're doing our own evaluation, these are the districts that we believe are our comparative peer group that we want to see information uh, about 
as we make judgments about uh, instruction, budgeting, and things of that nature. So does that answer your question? Or both of the yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So are these school districts at J J Pass? Are J school districts? Those are all J school districts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carol. No. What is the difference? Can you define grade level versus band? I don't understand the distinction. Sure. Uh, grade level means that there's, there, are, there would be arts education standards for grade one, arts education standards for grade two, all the way up through grade 12. Grade band is where you, the, the objective is to achieve the standard by the end of the grade sequence. So that could be grades one through three, four through six, seven through nine, nine through 12. So those are the different grade bands that they would have. So you would have a period of time to achieve the standards by the completion of that grade sequence as opposed to at the end of first grade, you're going to be doing A, B, C, and D. The reason why they do that here in the state is that districts approach instruction differently. Uh, and as a result, you want to be sure that students meet the standard by the time they reach a certain grade level as opposed to saying that all students in the state are going to have this competency by the end of grade one at least as it relates to the visual performing arts. Yeah, I had a question regarding the, the slide that you had for poor people art spending. Yes, ma'am. Where we had, it showed a West Virginia Hills Girls where it was on the lowest grade. You mentioned it didn't include faculty. Could you give an idea of what um, types of spending might have been included in that graph that didn't include faculty? Sure. We, we look at what we call curricular support. So those would be items like the paint supplies, music, um, you know, other types of materials that a, an educator would use to provide instruction. We exclude teacher salaries because what teacher salaries, what happens with teacher salaries because teacher salaries are the biggest budget item is when you compare teacher salaries with the curricular materials, the differential between the two is so great that there's no, when you look across districts, there's no real difference that you can see. So by factoring out the big dollars of, of, teacher, of teacher salaries, we're able to focus on what is the money that the district is investing to support the day-to-day -day instruction of the arts within that community. As a follow-up to that? Yes, sir. Did you look at the data point from what was on the budget in line to start the year? Or uh, we looked at the, day, the, the budget data that was provided by the individual school or school district. So, so depending on how the building principal responded to that question, depends on how... Yes, and I, be, I, I believe that Mr. Santoro was assisting them with that, so... It was the beginning of the year budget. So it was the beginning of the year budget line? Within the ARPS budget line. Yes. Not the not yes. Tens of thousands transferred out of general fund. Correct. Gotcha. So it's... Well, that may be, but I think that you know one of the things to look at is how right. how the matter is that. But fair point. Um, on your recommendation that you develop and implement dance and theater, as well as increase and diversify course offerings. So, is it safe to assume that when you talk about increase and diversify course offerings, you're not talking about dance and theater? Is that a separate recommendation that you're talking that about correct. additional course? offerings and diversity in the existing, basically, music and art. Can you give me some examples of the kinds of things that you're talking about? Um, in the report itself, we talk about some of the specific areas that would include uh, music and technology, composition, uh, different, different uh, art um, uh, forms that could be used in, in the visual art program, uh, digital art, uh, media arts. Uh, media arts is actually a new standard area that's being developed. Currently in the state of New Jersey, we have four content areas in dance, music, theater, and visual arts. The new standards actually creates a fifth area called media arts uh, to take advantage of the new technology and kind of the new ways that the arts are being integrated into, into other areas. So it gets back to the point that I made earlier about what does the room, when you walk into a, an arts room now, uh, or when you look at, at the arts course offerings today, do they look demonstrably different from what they would have looked like 
25 years ago, 30 years ago? Uh, and if not, what are the opportunities? What are some of the newer techniques? The other thing that I will say, um, not even related to technology, we can talk about uh, class guitar, we can talk about class piano. Uh, there are districts here in the state of New Jersey where 15% of the student population at the high school level are actually involved in a guitar program. Uh, and oftentimes, at the high school level, there are not opportunities for students to actually come in and start in the music program. Uh, so all of a sudden, if you have a beginning program of some type, any student, for whatever reason, hasn't participated or hasn't continued, they have the opportunity to actually come back in and pick up an arts discipline. One of the reasons why what we see in, is at high school level, there tends to be a few more visual arts students than music students is that visual art provides gateway opportunities for the non-art student to actually come in and participate as opposed to traditionally what you've seen in the music program. Other questions? Do you, do you think that um, you there was any overlap with um, courses that perhaps are offered in other disciplines, particularly at the high school and middle school level, like graphic computer arts, which is not, is not an arts course per se, it's listed under um, in business and careers. Um, did any of those were taking it, were those looked at in terms of sort of uh, becoming sort of arts courses or they were not really a focus of this? Um, you know, we really didn't focus on them. I mean, we were aware of them, but it was also pointed out at the time that, that it really wasn't an arts-based course. Uh, same thing was true of a um, um, the, the middle school performing arts uh, program itself, you know, what, what really wasn't, you know, fully developed in, in the way that uh, that type of program should be. So we were aware of them, uh, but we didn't look at them as part of, you know, what they could be or what they could mean moving forward. Certainly if you wanted to take a, a graphic design course or take advantage of the computer facilities and develop further, you know, more arts-based uh, computer design, the infrastructures there, based on what we witnessed in the two high schools, based on the technology investments that we've made there. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Santoro. I'm the supervisor for Fine and Performing Arts in Western New Plainsboro School District. Um, it is my pleasure to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to being able to give this presentation for a while now, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to do so. Um, before I go into uh, just this brief overview of what the internal committee did over the course of last year, I, I want to echo um, how Mr. Morrison started his presentation by saying that the committee members went into this um, process with the starting point of we, we are happy with what we have, um, this district has shown a tremendous amount of support um, and the arts programs have had a significant amount of success over the past several decades. And it was on that foundation that we started our work, we acknowledged our strengths and looked at ways we could improve the program. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking and acknowledging the people that were on this committee. Um, my co-chair in this process was Dr. Shauna Carter, who's the principal of Community Middle School. And um, as you can see, this was the rest of our committee. Um, <coughs> excuse me. When Dr. Carter and I sat down to uh, discuss who we wanted to invite to be on the committee, our goal was to not only represent all of the different areas of the arts program that we were offering at the time we started, um, but we also wanted to find people who could bring other perspectives to the process. So um, you will know this by looking at the list of names, but almost everyone in our, on our committee not only brought the perspective of their current role in our district, but also we have people on the committee who's, who have children in our, in our school who are in the arts program and who are not. We have uh, people on the committee who have children in other districts' arts programs or not. Uh, teachers who've been in the district for their entire career, teachers who have taught other places and then come here, um, we really tried to find, because uh, we were limited to, in how many people we could have, we tried to find people who could bring multiple perspectives to the process. Once we had the committee established, most of the work was done in subcommittees that uh, the committee members were placed on based on their area of expertise. So our art teachers um, sort of took care of soliciting from the faculty um, opinions about the art program. We had our music teachers split up into 
their background of uh, general or and slash vocal music and then also instrumental music. Um, and by the way, at all different uh, age levels, we had representation. Um, at the time we started this, our only theater uh, representation was from our extracurricular program. So we had people on the committee who could bring the perspective of both the middle school and the high school extracurricular uh, dra fall drama, spring musical um, perspective. And then we had uh, uh, administrators, we had some assistant principals, and one board member on the committee, and many brought to the process the perspective of their colleagues. Um, the process that we went through over the course of last year was pretty uh, straightforward and, and, and easy to understand. We began, as I mentioned earlier, by identifying our strengths and then talking about what we would want to see improve. So we called this initial document our strengths and weaknesses document. Um, once we kind of brainstormed that as a full committee, we broke it up into nine categories, which you'll see on my last few slides when we talk about recommendations. Um, and we then asked the subcommittees to take the uh, strengths and weaknesses that we identified as a full committee back to the faculty. So we spent about two months uh, giving the full music and art faculty an opportunity to um, take a look at the, re the uh, strengths and weaknesses that we came up with, add to it, ask questions about it, um, debate it, um, and that, like I said, took about two months. We got back together in the spring, and we um, came up with what ultimately ended up in the final document as each area's identified strengths and areas of improvement or recommendations. Um, in the document, you'll see that in some cases, recommendations are K-12 recommendations, and in other places, they are uh, delineated by age level as appropriate. Uh, the final step was in the late spring, early summer, I took the uh, recommendations and strengths from the group and added some narrative statements, which you'll see in the final report um, that just gives um, a little bit of context to each um, ensuing set of recommendations and strengths and that was delivered to the curriculum committee in the fall of this school year. Um, so as I mentioned, we divided our thought process into nine areas. Um, and that was just a, a way for us to uh, you know, collect our thoughts and organize our thinking. Um, and in the full report, there are multiple recommendations and multiple areas of strength identified for each of these nine categories. Um, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to summarize each one into one or two salient points that I think um, are, are, will give you an idea of where we're going and then if the board or anyone else would like to see exactly what we meant or get more detail, it's certainly there in the full document. Um, and it's interesting to me having now watched uh, Mr. Morrison's presentation, um, and by the way, we didn't, we, these two reports took place in complete isolation from one another. It's interesting for me to see where we aligned and, and had some common themes. Um, so to start off in communication, much like we saw in the external report, there was a feeling among the committee and among the, the faculty at large that we should uh, raise awareness within the school and community about the arts education that's happening in our schools. Um, there was a strong feeling by our teachers that our students create beautiful artwork, our students create beautiful music, we want more people to see it and hear it. Um, so that was a recommendation that came out that we um, increase our, um, our work on raising awareness within the school and the community on our arts education programs. Um, one way that was specifically mentioned to do this, and again it was mentioned in the external report, is to uh, reinstate the National Art Honor Society, and I would add uh, maybe look into adding Music One as well, to assist in this because as Mr. Morrison said, that puts um, that puts the students in the forefront of sharing their work with the community and the schools. Um, in terms of curriculum, it was a lot of the things you've heard already tonight. Continue to update the curriculum, and that means uh, aligning it to the new standards as well, um, while expanding course offerings, both within the arts areas that we already offer, and also in theater and dance. Um, we have started down this process already. Um, two years ago, we revived our high school computer art and design class, which is our, um, our one computer-based art offering. And uh, next school year, we will be running our first official theater class in both high schools with a theater certified teacher. So we're, we, we're on the way to this, and we want to continue uh, moving forward. In terms of facilities, uh, th this, this category and a few of the other ones coming up are all tied to the common theme of Enrollment in our programs has increased, and some other things maybe have not increased along with them. 
So as our programs have grown, which is a great problem to have, it has put a stress on some of our schools, especially some of the older and smaller ones. So a recommendation is to evaluate our, both our instructional and storage space in all of our buildings. Every building has, almost every building, has a, uh, an issue with either instructional or storage space or both. Um, so the recommendation is to look into that. Um, and also uh, a common theme in, among our committee was actually HVAC concerns and not just the um, you know, uncomfortable nature of the learning environment that they can cause, but also the uh, damage or potential damage to equipment and expensive instruments um, when they go unattended for long periods of time. Budget. Um, again, as our enrollment has gone up, some of the budget items have not, um, and that's a concern for two reasons, increased enrollment, which I mentioned, but also supplies um, become more expensive. And the supply issue is more on the art side. Um, there, there was one teacher on the committee who shared with me that in the 20 plus years they've been in the district, the art budget at their school has been exactly the same. Meanwhile, the cost of clay and paint and you know, uh, canvases and all the materials go up every year. Um, so that was a concern that uh, we wanted to make sure was reflected in the report. Um, and the other piece was to ensure budget equity between the schools. Um, there's a, a data point in the report, and I don't remember the exact dollar amounts, but it's interesting to see when you compare you know, elementary to elementary, middle to middle, high school to high school, um, the wide variation of per pupil spending, just the dollar amount budgeted in, in our instructional supplies accounts divided by the kids in the program, um, there's a pretty wide disparity. So equity among the programs was a, um, a piece of the rec one recommendation also. Um, materials and equipment. Um, just to have a plan for the replacement and, repl and repair of our aging instruments and equipment inventory. Um, the yearly budget that's given to each program um, covers instructional supplies, some of them being consumable that are used in one year. Um, and there, at the time of this report, was no mechanism in place for replacing instruments, repairing aging instruments, um, and again, keeping up with the rise of the um, And then the second thing that was important for the internal committee was, and this was a common theme, um, more common than I was expecting, is just the desire that uh, to have anyone who's either working with our equipment in terms of moving it or cleaning the rooms or handling it in the summers um, to be trained on how to properly take care of the equipment. Um, believe it or not, a lot of things get damaged or worn out over time simply because someone may not know how to move a timpani from one room to another without damaging it or that you shouldn't put you know, jugs of water on the piano. Um, so there was a desire among the faculty to make sure that, they're all trickling. Um, there was a desire among the faculty to make sure that anyone who's um, handling our equipment, whether it's you know, uh, custodial staff or buildings and grounds, is just trained on how to do it safely and um, in a way that doesn't damage the equipment. For professional development, it was pretty simple. There was a, a, an appreciation among the faculty um, for the amount of time <coughs> devoted in school and in the school year for PD, um, but there was a desire to have that be a little bit more discipline specific, um, and we've been working towards that. Um, Mr. Morrison mentioned scheduling. I think if you did a report like this in any district in the state, you, you'd see a category about scheduling. Um, so our recommendation is to examine the schedule at all levels to ensure that as many students as possible can participate and meet on a consistent basis. Um, and there are specific um, ways that for each grade level, there are specific recommendations in terms of scheduling in the full report. Um, staffing, again, as, as in, enrollment has increased, uh, staffing hasn't. So one recommendation was to uh, look at that and ensure that the staffing um, is offering an appropriate and consistent learning environment for all of our students. And the last piece was technology. Again, echoing what was in the external report, um, the teachers had two sort of um, approaches to thinking about technology. One was just make sure that the classrooms have the basic things. So if it's a music classroom, there's um, a working stereo system, a way to record the kids, a way to play music, and a, you know, to show videos. Um, on the art side, um, making sure that there's projectors of a high quality in every room for displaying artwork, um, document cameras, things like that. So there was a desire to have the basics in all rooms, and not some. And and then in addition to that, there was a desire to be trained on 
and be given more technology and uh, to be up on the cutting edge of what's out there. Um, so that's a real brief overview of what the internal committee came up with. Um, before I turn it over to the board for questions, I, I want to thank on behalf of all the music and art teachers, um, I want to thank the board, I want to thank the administration for allowing us to go through this um, program review. Um, as I said at the beginning, we have a, an incredible foundation to build upon and I look forward to the work moving forward to move the department into uh, whatever's coming next. So any questions from the board, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions? Yes, not. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now uh, we hear from Dr. Adam Hole on uh, the impact of residential developments, particularly at the Polk Elementary School. So, good evening, everyone. Um, before I start this part of the presentation, first let me thank our presenter and uh, Bob and Jeff for your presentations. I want to thank all the music and art staff that are here this evening uh, to support um, your colleagues in this work. Um, I think I can say that um, we have had an opportunity to uh, look at the internal review a little bit longer because it was presented um, over the summer to the curriculum committee. So when we move towards this year's budget creation, we did look at staffing and we did look at replacement costs for instruments as two mechanism components that were built within. So under the tentative budget that's been approved by the Board of Education, that goes for a formal review at April 25th meeting, uh, there are three additional music staff members built within the budget to be determined within uh, the department. So I know Jeff has those charges to work with the department to talk about the where. Uh, but we also looked at the concept of the um, a 20 year replacement cycle for instruments. Now, I know that uh, Jeff has asked for inventories within each building. So, we looked at if you have a 20 year replacement cycle um, and you look at 5% uh, of instruments being replaced per year, that would be $50,000 based on the current $1 million dollar inventory we currently have. Uh, but the inventory matters, so we know that inventory is not complete. So, that can, you know, as we update the inventory, then obviously we can. That 5% might become 60000 in a year if we realize we actually have $1.2 million worth of instruments. So the inventory is important. And obviously, we'll have to take time to look through other aspects of the arts program. Um, so I did want to just say that and say thank you to all of you for being here this evening. I think of all our program reviews, this is the largest crowd of staff that we have. So credit to you. So uh, joining me here this evening is George Goofy. Uh, our district architect and FBFD. Um, I just thought I'd start by framing this portion of the presentation, actually a slide from a month ago's presentation. Because tonight we're gonna to talk about Maurice Hawk, and then we're gonna also talk about some other areas of concern and growth within the district. But we're gonna look at the footprints of the property. And we're not gonna look at it as this is what we're going to do, but what are the potential possibilities on our district property? So when you see some of the future slides down the road, I don't want anyone to run out of the room or say, I can't believe they're going to do this. The charge that we gave George was to say, if we were to build without any additional land acquisition, what could we possibly do to the land we have? Not should we, but what could we do? Right? So there's, that's a big difference. You know, there's a lot of what, what should we do and what's right for the building, what's the largest size, and what should an elementary school be in size, and what's too big. Those are big questions that have to be answered. But we just asked about facility capacity and then land, or really land capacity at this point. It's a real big picture. So as we talk about Maurice Hawk, um, I presented on, and I will continue to present on this topic, uh, this is what I would call phase one growth in the district. Um, Woodstone property is a Crimson Theological Seminary. Right now that is a, um, it's called a convening plan. In other words, it's met all the variances and architectural requirements by the, by the planning board within West Windsor. It's just not submitted for final approval. We expect this to happen in June or July. They're just waiting on a, a one soil clearance, and this should come forward. That's 443 appointments, uh, parts, excuse me. Uh, the Manili Toll Brothers property has been approved. It's in two um, bands because you have both apartments and townhomes, but then you also have Project Freedom. That's 100 students that we're expecting on the Toll Brothers property. 
And Ellsworth is 12, it's apartments over retail. And that is the West Windsor portion, that 484 number you see there. But what's important is they all send to Hoff Village, most send to Grover's and South. It's just those 12 apartments at Ellsworth that have to be determined. So the reality is Hawk Village, Grover South are seeing this grow. But anyone who's walked into Hawk knows that there's limited to no space. There is one room that we believe we can repurpose next year uh, for a growth um, classroom, uh, which will happen next year. And then we're really at a capacity concern at Morris Hawk. The projected timeline on this is 2019. So you also have the Forestville Village that's been approved. It has the groundbreaking is supposed to be a year ago. It has not happened at this point. That will send to Wyckoff and Wilson River community in North. The scarier numbers are actually on future slides, which is last month's presentation. On the board, on the website, and, and it is um, net with Howard Hughes potential plus all the other developments, most of them because of the Council on Affordable Housing, over a 10 year to 15 year period, 3,200 additional students potential. You're talking the size of Robbinsville School District. Most of being on the West Windsor side of town. So that brings us to the charge we gave Mr. Duthie. And George and I are going to sort of co facilitate this. If George, by all means, please come up and join me. <coughs> and what we asked George to do is to talk about um, planning for future capacity and again, specifically <coughs> within Hawk. But then we're going to go into some of the other properties. Thanks, Dave. So, as Dave said, we had a collaborative effort. It's been ongoing, actually, to uh, kind of hone in on uh, the various options and things that we're going to have to look at. We have a lot of work to do. And I think if uh, those of you who heard uh, Dave's presentation last month, those are some numbers. And we really do have to uh, work diligently, come up with a plan. So we do have a table of contents. We're going to just kind of go through the slides and just kind of show where our thinking lies today. But to give you an idea of some of the things that we're going to have to take care of sooner rather than later in some cases. So what is the facilities expansion goal for the district? And uh, we, we, we actually uh, talked about this for a while. But as a community, to provide capacity for all students while maintaining the level of programs that you currently have or grow some of the programs. That's the presentation we just heard, for example. So opportunities. What are the challenges? You've already heard. Expected dramatic increase in growth and enrollment over the course of the next two, three, or five years, and even further out, as soon as 2018. Tasks and time required. We're going to talk about some of that, and some of the expansion options, limited in some cases. So the realities, present facilities at a near capacity in many cases, okay? Class size pressure beginning to be felt. Significant development is expected in West Windsor, but also in Plainsboro, and a short time frame to do something. So, we do have a plan for a phase one project at Maurice Hawk School for July of 2019 completion. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but as you can see from the timeline here, we have to work quickly to get ready to go because, you know, in addition to the actual construction, we have to do a lot of due diligence work, there's a lot of agency approvals, and of course we have to get the project ready to go out uh, to bid to contractors. So. Let's talk a little bit about options and what the pros and cons are. And this is just a quick look. Expanding the existing buildings, right? Makes sense. Land and buildings are rarely available. These are the pros. Shorter construction time. It may avoid the need to redistrict, right? Cons, there's an impact on core facilities, cafeterias, music rooms, art rooms, gymnasiums, okay? You know, how big can you build? Impact on occupants while the work is taking place, right? And even if you build on to certain buildings, it may be an insufficient amount of space. New construction. A larger building can obviously absorb a larger population. It can be designed from the ground up the way you need it to be. But land acquisition, the process of, of actually acquiring the land, and the cost of land is, you probably all know, is very expensive in this area, okay? And it's also scarce. And when we talk about land being scarce, you have to understand for a school, we need a very large parcel of land. It's very difficult to find land that doesn't have some type of an environmental issue associated with it that may or may not make that parcel appropriate for a school, or it may make it difficult 
not impossible to build, but costly. A longer construction time, obviously for new construction, and also, of course, as we said, a higher site development cost. So, what about retrofit? What about, we also looked at this, retrofitting an existing non-district owned facility, sure, may reduce construction costs and have a shorter time duration until we occupy the building. But there is the initial acquisition cost for the same reason as land is expensive, so is building space. Adaptability to school use is obviously an issue. You have to be able to take that building and adapt it. You know, office buildings and things like that can be adapted, but uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And appropriate exterior facilities, don't forget, with schools, we need fields, we need parking facilities, and, thing, and we need a way to separate vehicle traffic buses and uh, pedestrians and so forth. So, to address overcrowding in the short term, population pressure, enrollment pressure, we are looking at a way, and this will address both Hawk and Village, okay, with an expected completion in July of 2019. This involves a one-story addition in blue on the front of the building facing Clark's lower okay? Now, we will also make some site improvements, including parking, separating parent drop-off and bus loop. This is a very conceptual plan right now and replacing some of the play area. To the right, you'll see a potential future addition area, and we're going to talk about that as we move on. But this is about a $12.5 million project. This is a very rough number right now. We still have some work to do. Uh, it will encompass you know, both the addition and the site work as well. And we would expect to complete that project in July or August of 2019. Now, the project consists of uh, an addition with 16 classrooms, um, music and art rooms, okay, because we do have to build those to accommodate the additional population. Uh, child study team spaces and offices to continue the special education programs within the district. So for the good of the room, it can be a little difficult to see. Uh, the dotted line here, that would be the new addition component. Yeah. Right, the outline. Um, all right. So this is your current uh, for hallway. It comes to a dead end. This is the, the addition that came on the back side. It does not connect here right now. So be adding classroom space in, connecting, connects this hallway as well, and it creates a, creates a loop. Right. And, then, and then this is phase one. It's it also then floor. repurposes some classroom space, shifts thing around, some things around. So you can see by the color scale. And all this, all a lot of this can shift, except when you get into pre-K and K, because there's size limitations by room, and of course then there has to be a bathroom in those rooms. So you, you might notice, just because our music teachers are here, you might, you might notice. <laughs> <laughs> this is your, your current music, music room back here. It's subdividing, creating like a resource or a um, small group instruction room, an OTPT room, because this would be your LLD classroom space, and then it adds a brand new music and storage facility here in the corner. Right, and then this is our current computer classroom, but based on the way of Chromebooks, um, we can repurpose that room and create a second music room uh, here at Hawk by repurposing the computer room, which also has a storage room and a bathroom already in that particular facility. So two art rooms and two, and two music rooms in the uh, configuration. And, and, and very good connectivity, ways to get around. We're also going to do things like enhance the main entrance to the building and things like that as well. So, so there are some, some other projects that go along with it. So. so if I could for one second, what this does is it adds 16 classrooms. And, um, but four of those rooms would be, would be used for pre-K classrooms that come from here in the village. And that would shift over because when you look at that growth of nearly 500 students, uh, we project 40% would come in the uh, pre-K uh, three range, which means you're gonna have another 100 approximately students coming here to Village, which means we need four more classrooms at a minimum. We figured that would happen at some point, and we always knew that those four pre-K classrooms that are currently too many explore and two pre-K here next year will be four pre-K would at some point need to shift. So by building a little larger at Hawk, we can then accommodate the pre-K, move them over to a K-3 facility currently, makes more sense from a grade level band, and it opens up the four classrooms here for the four-five at Village. 
So this particular addition at Hawk also addresses growth classrooms for the fourth and fifth grade here at, here at Village. It does not, and that's where we're going next, address anything at Grover or, or anything at High School South. So this is an addition at Grover Middle School. It is a ball classroom addition, and there's two stories. I'll show you where it goes. Uh, this is one possibility for a shorter term solution at Grover Middle School. This is not currently planned for construction, but uh, it gives you an idea of just some of the things we've been thinking about. We're going to show you some other ideas. <coughs> High School South. High School South. That site is pretty full right now. I mean, I'm sure you all know. <laughs> Very hard to find anywhere to expand an ice hook set. We do think we can put a small addition on the front of Panama Road, the main entrance drive to the building. That's about it. All of these concepts have to be explored in terms of uh, lots of different things, including uh, stormwater management, things like that. But we do think we can construct a one or two story addition there. It's obviously to be a very filled out site at that point, right? And obviously we have to do all these projects involve extra parking and you know other facilities that also have to be managed at the same time. So that's High School South. Now, longer term, longer term. So an, an exploration of potential expansion options. And this is a very preliminary uh, examination. We're going to talk about kind of like the next steps that we have to take. But all of these have to take into consideration, as I said, parking, traffic, stormwater management, uh, you know, Delaware and Raritan Canal Commission, things like that, okay, are all uh, elements that uh, impact our projects, okay? And they have to be balanced against the future enrollment growth, okay, and the need for potential new facilities, you know. Can we build enough expansions, you know, to get us through the number of students we're expecting to see come, come on board, all right? So Maurice Hawk. First place, we looked earlier at the front. We talked about that phase one addition there. And in the blue outline to the right is where we could possibly build another one or two story addition on the Reese Hawk School. It becomes a very large school. But reality is, if we're talking about the difficulty of acquiring land, the cost, or land we already own, these are some of the decisions we have to make as a community about what is going to happen. So this is one possibility, later on, not right away. So, so with this, again, I, I want to make sure that no one walks out of here saying they're going to do this. When, when I talk to George, even on the High School South and the Grover property, it is we have an identified uh, idea of the population that's going to be coming for Grover and for South. We know we need to do something to, to alleviate the space. Like right now, we added lockers this year to Grover in order for every student to have a locker. Um, and I know Dr. Carter knows there's no real room at community to send them to. Um, that's not currently true at North. North has had a down uh, cycle, but I also know that in two years to three years, the population at community will push them right back into the mid 1500s again. So this is not, this was about footprint, the footprint of the property of Hall. If this happened as a two story phase two addition, you would be talking about an elementary school the size of High School South. So then when we have to ask that question, is that a good idea? And then you have to ask the question, do you have land to make it that it, it's okay not to do that? And right now, the district does not own any property to even consider building on another location. So it gets into the land acquisition concept that George has been referencing. High School North. So High School North, as uh, Dave mentioned right now, yeah, there's a little bit of room there. Eventually, the kids are going to come, and you know, you need additional nine ball classroom space. And so, North does fortunately have you know the ability to be expanded fairly easily. Okay, so this would be a possibility again, a possibility for expansion of high school North should one be needed at some time in the future. North is one of our biggest footprints as a as a facility. It's, it is our biggest. It's 90 acres. Um, so, what you're looking at is, the, well, they keep shifting where the students and staff park. I think that's the student, no, yeah. staff parking yeah. yeah. staff now. We switch yeah. right on the tennis court side, the football side, yeah. uh, or the yeah. turf field side. Yeah. Um, so, again, now the question starts to become, are we comfortable having a high school of 2,000 and a high school of 1,600, or a high school of 2,200 and a high school of 1,600? Or do we, 
do we want to try to keep parity between size of school? And if we do, where do the other 600 potential students are? We, we project if everything happened at full build out, 250 to 300 students per grade. Right, so you're talking about the future 1,200 additional high school students, 900 additional middle school students on the upper end, right? So Thomas Grover, again, in the blue, we talked about that earlier addition, right? In the yellow, a possible another addition at Thomas Grover, again, becomes a large school, but does have the ability to be expanded. It will require reconfiguration of parking lots, driveways, and things like that. So every one of these solutions comes with challenges in terms of site design and all the other things we've discussed, right? But this is a, it is a possibility to expand Thomas Grover. So there it is, you know, if it's built out, just so you can see the relationship between possible new construction and the existing building. It's a substantial footprint. And uh, possible rerouting in red at the top of the uh, access yeah, drive. Right there. Yeah, okay. The other thing is you do have some limitations. Like for instance, Grover has geothermal fields. So you can't, can't build out in certain parts of the property because you can't go over the geothermal wells, right? So then there's facility limitations that almost happens at every property. Um, and you'll notice that um, you see uh, cafeteria space um, in yellow, that try to add additional student cafeteria as well as additional gyms. So when George talked about core facilities being stretched, um, right now Grover has not gone to split lunches like community has within its grade levels, but that those kind of ideas will have to happen if, if we don't have facility. I'm sorry? Red dots. Um, red dots. Red dots would be the rerouting of the bus, lo the bus loop. Well, thank you. Good question. Town Center. Now, I want to see that these are just additions that we're trying to add with minimal impact at this time. Does that mean that you can't do a much larger project at Whitehall or at Town Center Elementary School or a place like that by reconfiguring parking lots and roadways, moving land? Sure, it could probably be done. We're going to look at that as well. But this is Town Center, it's a small addition, two stories, maybe eight rooms. But just to give you an idea of what we've been looking at, okay? And again, so George, um, with that, um, one of the things that's not on the slide I showed you at the beginning in the framing is that Town Center, excuse me, Plainsboro has a hundred obligation for COA, affordable housing. On Day Road, they're going to be building a hundred unit, I believe they're going to start with 72 units and then potentially add another 28. That, send, that will send to Town Center. Town Center is at 100% capacity with no rooms available. So again, if we're going to have to start looking at Town Center, just like we're looking at, um, just like we're looking at Hawk, Town Center immediately starts becoming problematic when it comes to number of students that will be coming there out of future, uh, future complexes. If we do nothing, the impact is class size. And I know just from a teaching perspective, we don't want it to go over a certain number. From a parent perspective, we're not happy when we hear, start hearing class sizes 27 to 30. But if we do nothing proactively, that's, those are the kind of things we could be looking at in the future. Millstone River and actually Community Middle School, as you know, right next door. Now, is there an area for possible growth and expansion? Yes, there is. And it's, it's right between the two buildings. It's very difficult. This site has some environmental issues. It has wetlands. You know, there's play space and uh, there's some topography. So it would, be, uh, it would be difficult to kind of push out, although on the far right side of Millstone River, there may be a possibility of a larger project. Right now, we're homing in on this area, and maybe even on the front of community, the two-story signs right in front of community's uh, middle right. school as well, would be candidates for an expansion. Right. So we have um, wetlands issues back in here, and there's a border around all of it. And then we have drainage right in here that would all have to be rerouted. So building anything out to the right or behind has some pretty big conflicts pretty quick. So. Going in the middle would require rerouting the way the, the bus loop and the way you enter into Millstone River or into the side entrance of the community would be thought of. But it actually is quite a large uh, area of land 
if you drive over there and you start looking at that footprint, and it could potentially accommodate either building based on our need. And I will just say, just because there's a lot of folks here, um, remember Millstone River was built as UES, or the upper elementary school. And by design, it was built with only one classroom with a bathroom. So in other words, if we ever got into the R word of redistricting, Millstone River cannot be a K-5 building unless we add either a K wing or a pre-K wing to it, and then and or repurpose Millstone River for a completely different concept. And then you would need to relocate currently 1,100 students plus the additional students coming. So wipe off, again, just a quick concept of wipe off. What can we do? Add on to the oldest part of the building, right? And we need to wing in the front. Um, and we, th we think we do have the potential to add a two-story addition there. Obviously, architecturally, we want to make that complement the building as they announced, very nice building. And <clears throat> this is one idea for how that can be done. You know, popping out the back towards engineer, you know, getting into that more residential area. Can it be done? There's a big field back there. It can be done, sure, but we have to, that's another decision we have to think about, you know, is that, is that in fact desirable? It may be necessary, but is it, is it really what we want to do to wipe off school? So these are the kinds of challenges we face. So, as I said, new facility, land acquisition, okay, uh, requires, before you can even purchase the land, approval from the Department of Education, it's actually in the law, okay, and uh, you are required to file that before you can buy that. And that requires a site assessment to be done. In fact, a rather complex site assessment, a phase two site assessment has to be completed. That can take six to 12 months alone just to finish that process by the time you finish all the due diligence. And George, that's pre-purchase. That's before you can buy that. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Non-district facility, retrofit possibilities, yes. And so uh, it can be done if the appropriate facility is found, right, but there has to be consideration of the things. Is it appropriate for it to be a school? What type of things you have to do to adapt the building? Uh, you know, adaptive reuse is nice, but more difficult for schools, right? And, and this question so, came out of, well, we know there's some empty corporate offices in the area. You know, could we look at their footprint? Would they be willing to sell? Let's say they're willing to do a lease purchase. What would that look like? Could we potentially repurpose a school or, or a corporate office with land, parking already, to be a school facility. So those were the kind of questions we're throwing out to George to let him run with it to see, you know, what's, is there any potential there? And so we're looking at all options at this point to try to say, uh, when we talk to the township staffs of both West Windsor and Plainsboro, between um, the value of our lands in our community and the open space movement that's happened over the last 15 years, a lot of land has been purchased and designated. So there's not a lot of uh, either one attractive land or land that's in areas in which we'd want a school that's left for purchase. And those that are, are either not for sale, we'd have to go through a potentially a, a eminent domain court battle, um, or they're very expensive and it would require um, a process to get the uh, DOE to allow us to even purchase the land, a lengthy process, plus referendum just to buy the land. Um, because you're not talking hundreds of thousands, you're talking millions um, for a property before you build a school. So it, it's a very expensive proposition to get into land acquisition. That doesn't mean we don't need to go there. And of course, you've seen on the Howard Hughes property map, they designate a 30-something acre lot for the potential school slash community use. There is no guarantee that that facility um, or that, that land is designated to us, given to us, sold to us, or used by the township or other uses. So just because they put it on a map does not mean we have any rights to it. Um, and that's really important to know. So now you're talking about land acquisition for that p potential property is 1,600 students potentially by itself. And today I just received from them the, break, the schematic breakdown of the total number of bedrooms by units by phase. So now I have to redo my whole projection based on that, that number. So, so you know, hopefully in a couple of weeks I'll have, have some new ideas from that. But based on the number of four and three bedrooms, I tell you, there should be more kids, not less. So 
it, for the board, it's important to note that that timeline assumes a capital, uh, an action out of reserves and not a referendum. If you, if we went the referendum route, we're talking uh, 2020 at the earliest and kids coming before school at that point. And that's a decision the board will have to make for Hawk. But just Hawk. Well, ultimately we'll probably need uh, either to put tremendous dollars towards, you know, into reserves or into capital outlay in the future to drive towards Grover in South, or we'll have to do a referendum for the second part of, um, for the Grover South property. Because at that point, we will not be in a position that we can take another action out of reserves at this point. Uh, questions for George or for myself from the board? Are we going to get an updated demographic report? So we're currently in conversation with Dr. Grip from Statistical Forecasting. Um, we believe he's going to be coming on board with George as a contract um, employee with, with them to help do some additional work for us on the demographic side. He is the one that did our last demographic study. Anyone else? So the, the, the short-term small pocket, small pocket edition is based on only the development that's already approved. It's not based on Howard Hughes or any of the COA stuff. Right. right, so there are, that's, that's correct. So the three additional big properties um, that are out, well, there's more than three, but you have the, you have the low center property, which is a COA designated property at 650 um, apartments or townhomes. Um, that is a, that's behind Lowe's area on Route 1 North. Then you have the Transit Village property, which has an interested developer potentially on uh, coming, coming, has been talking for a couple months. We'll see what happens with that. That's an 800 unit court designated property with 12.5% set aside for COA. Um, so you have those two. You have a Thompson property, which is over off of um, Old Trenton Road that sends to Dutch Neck. That is 150 townhomes, sets to Dutch Neck, Village, Grover, and South. Um, then you have Howard Hughes, of course. And the question is, assuming that lot, let's just pretend that 30 acres comes to the district, the question becomes, what do we build there? And let's say we build a K-5. Then it questions, what do you do with all the other elementaries? But then it also is, where do you send the 612 component of that? Right. No, but my point is yeah. that if none of that comes to happen, if none of how we use Lowe's, we still have to do something. Of, I, do we, we still have to do Hawk for the stuff that's already there. Correct. Hawk, Hawk, and then again, Grover South. And we believe we can accommodate Village by moving the four pre-K out. But we'll have to do something to Grover and South. I think we should keep in mind that the capacity report done by Stan Katz and John Koss show that there is now space for about 1,000 to 1,200 kids in existing schools. Yeah, I can speak to that. Okay. So, so we're talking about functional capacity versus how we're currently utilizing our facilities. So functional capacity is a determination of um, gross area of building divided by a per student square foot allowance by code. So you take High School North, for instance, 320,000 square feet. You divide High School North by 151 square foot per student, which is the code, and you come to just over 2,000 students, uh, 2,000 know, 2, students for that building. There is no way High School North will fit 2,000 students programmatically. Right? So the question is, what are you willing not to offer to students? Are you saying that Stan Katz and John Koss didn't, didn't take that into account when they made their chart of school capacity? I'm saying that in 2004, when that report was done, a lot of factors have changed with how we use our buildings. That was a 2004 capacity committee. And we do not use our buildings the same way. For instance, uh, let's think about town center. How many students did Town Center hold two years ago? It was over 800, 850. Town Center currently holds around 650 students. But we changed the way in which we use nine of our classrooms. Those classrooms used to hold uh, 24 to 26 students. Those rooms were 
redesigned and repurposed as we moved some of our MD autistic and special needs classrooms and now they have students of four to eight students per four to six students per classroom. The differential of 20 students times nine rooms is 180 students. You can change the capacity of that building by re relocating nine sections of special needs students, but you have a responsibility to educate them. So you're either going to send the students out of district at a 50,000 plus per student average, or you're going to build facility and program for students. Because we have a legal obligation to meet the needs at the least restrictive environment. So how we utilize facility, uh, we've changed the way our music program is in our elementary school in first grade, I want to say. First grade. Kindergarten and first. Kindergarten and first. But the minute we did that, we needed more classroom space. So a classroom at Hawk that used to be designated for a general education classroom is now being used several days per week as a music classroom. And we can keep going on and on with examples of how the, how the rooms were used differently over time. One more, one more comment Science about, programs at the, about high the area allowances that Dave just referred to. They came from the Department of Education. They didn't, they, they're not numbers that are typically used to determine you know, what I would consider to be a district practices capacity. You have two types of capacity. District practices, which is based upon your programs, your class sizes, you know, the diversity within your schools, and what the Department of Education says is your functional capacity. And that's based in, first of all, it's 16 years old, 17 years old, because it's based in the 2000 RCEFA law, Educational Facilities Financing and Constructing, Construction Act. Okay? So it's 17 years old. Schools have changed a lot since then. And it's really done by the Department of Ed for one reason. And that's to determine how much money the Department of Education is going to contribute towards the price of that space for your, for your kids. Okay? And what they did to arrive at that is they developed facility efficiency standards based on model schools, which is based on constructing a brand new school from scratch. Not an old building that was built back in the 1960s, which may or may not be as efficient as a brand new building could be. So what the state said, we're going to take a common number, we're just going to apply it to everybody, even if your building's different than the, the, next, the next district over, because that's how we're going to pay you when we reimburse you for those students who are coming to your district. But again, well, not, not modern by any stretch of the imagination now. And I think it's also important to note that when you talk about functional capacity, you're talking about square footage of every square foot in that building. So in other words, you're talking about hallways, common multi-purpose rooms, libraries. So think about North and the difference of North's hallways versus some of the other schools. You, know, you, can, you can land a small Cessna down the front hallway, uh, but that all counts as capacity, a capacity the way in which the square foot formula works on functional capacity. Well, the problem is that you're asking the board to make a decision about spending millions of taxpayer dollars, and we need to know real numbers for capacity of all the buildings. We can't just say, oh, well, maybe it's less, or maybe it isn't. We have to have real numbers to work with. We have to have real numbers for demography projections and real numbers for capacity of schools. What we have now is the 2004 report, which you're discounting because it's old. Okay, fine. Then what are the real numbers? Cannot make this decision without real numbers of capacities for the schools. So, well, I guess what I'd say there is we know that our class size average at Hawk is approximately 23 to 24 students. And we know we have one room that we can repurpose next year. So then the question I have for the board is where are you going to put the other students when they come? No, I think, I think what she's saying is given the way we run our schools now, the, the way our program is currently defined, and the class sizes that we are hoping to achieve, can you calculate a number for Hawk? For Hawk, based on phase one, you're going to need at least two classrooms per grade level. I understand. Right? I'm just saying, can you calculate for us the capacity number based on our programmatic use of the facilities? Is that? What I think, yeah. okay. I mean, not now, it's not yet, but yeah, not if there are so many classrooms that walk in, yep. you know, we can, we can do that. 20, 24, at a certain level, how many I mean, It's just that? a breakdown based on yeah. how the rooms are used, based on the total number of rooms for general space. Yes. 
and what you have available. Part of one of the decisions that the board has to make is also um, what kind of district we want to remain. I mean, we can, you know, cancel programs, fill up, you know, turn classes and turn, you know, I don't want to say it with them watching, but, you know, <laughs> you know change music rooms into classrooms and, and cancel all those programs. But if we still want to be the district that West Windsor Plain Blower is, that's, you know, that's my decision. Well, and, and so the, uh, part of that question is, do you want to be ahead of the growth, or do you want to react to the growth? And well, right. what and I want to do is I want to know what the exact numbers are for every building, for capacity, as Louisa said, with our current program. And I want to know what the demographer says about when we need what, and I want it to be a math equation that I can figure out and be confident of and be willing to convince everything, everyone else and every taxpayer that it's the right thing to do. I don't want to be guessing, and I don't want to be hoping, and I don't want to be you know, trying to say, oh, well, maybe they won't be special in that class, but I don't really know. It's, we have to have real numbers. Let's, let's remember that it's not going to be an exact formula. We don't know when things are going to get built. We're, here to use our judgment to make our, right. make our okay, best So judgment. right so, now we have a projection that was up on the screen of 562 students. Currently we have capacity for 1,000 students in the school, so we don't need to build anything. No, we That's don't. what no. I'm saying. No. You have no. to give us the real numbers for capacity. We've discussed this and we'll provide that. Okay. But let, let, me, let me go further. We, we don't have room for 500 students today. And further, if we wait for the perfect math formula for every facility, the board will be in a position where you will not be ready for Maurice Hawk. Because there is no way that we will be in a position to provide you with the perfect formula, with demographic everything perfect, um, in before you have to make a decision in order for us to be ready for 2019. If you want that year, you will not have facility in time for kids. And that's the board's prerogative, but I would not recommend it. And we know enough about what's coming right now to know that we need rooms. Because our, if we go from our net, our net what's empty scenario, you can fit 25 students into Hawk right now. 200 plus are coming, plus the four sections from over here that we need. And that doesn't change kindergarten. It doesn't meet any out of district special education needs. It just talks about what's coming from t both Hawk and for, to Hawk and from Village. Well, we also have this room that could be used as classrooms or a couple conference rooms on this no. floor. No. I mean, that's existing space. I'll let the architect address that. No, no there wasn't approved as educational space. And it is not suited as used for educational space. Yes, and I'll just add something. Yeah, we have trailers and parking lots yeah. and house kids. Is that what we want West Windsor Plainsboro to be? Like I said, there's, we have a bunch of uh, responsibilities as board members, and one is to maintain the quality of the district. And yes, if we have, you know, if we don't do anything and some of these children uh, materialize at the schools, we can find something. We can uh, put in trailers, I don't know, the architecture. But is that what we want? We, we can put, children into larger classes. We can move out special ed and send them somewhere else and pay for those tuitions. But this is a decision that the nine elected members here have to grapple with and be able to answer if we guess wrong. If we say there isn't gonna be any construction or the work that the buildings that are, um, the apartments that are coming on in the next two years aren't gonna deliver that many kids, we still have to face the public if we're wrong. So that's, that's something that the nine of us, as individuals, have to decide what we want. Uh, comment eight. Uh, and I, I understand the need of help for, for more information. I think that that's, you know, that's, that's a good thing to want to have more information. But I also think to just look at capacity and just look at numbers, I, I think we need more because I think with capacity, 
it sounds like what we're saying is a potential for class size increases. And I, I do know that at least from a community standpoint, that's another thing that this community would be concerned about. So, we, But I also understand the concern from a taxpayer perspective and wanting more information. So I do think that we need all that, but we also right. have to put all of so, those things into account. That is my concern of just looking at numbers only so this, from a capacity point this, of view is class size. I just finished this this weekend. Right, so Howard Hughes asked me to break down some data on some some roads, and I figured, well, let me take a look at it before. You know, I'm not just giving that over to him. So look at the student yields, right? And these are developments that they asked for. So Windsor Woods is yielding 75%. Uh, Princeton Terrace, 80, 82%. A couple kids moved out from our 84 from before. Uh, Muse of Princeton Junction, 65%. Then in townhomes, estates, 118, 120%. Uh, student yield, that's current live data. Students per bed. Students per apartment complex. Uh, Windsor Haven, 40, 48, 49%. Windsor Ponds, 82%. The average across the ones they asked for was 76%. You know, so we projected at 0.84 um, when we were doing our projections. The demo, they were using, uh, I think it was 0.52. Even if we just take our 0.76 average across the 443, you know, you're talking more kids than you have space. The demographer's not gonna give you much better than that. So the board will have to wrestle with this. Ultimately, at this point, we have uh, board authority to move forward with um, some of our um, engineering work, surveying work. surveying work with Van Cleef, and we'll be bringing forward additional work in future meetings for your consideration, moving the Hawk project forward. In the meantime, we'll work on additional data. But working with demographers, this is the kind of stuff they do. This is the work they're going to do, and we're already doing it. Any other questions? <laughs> Maybe uh, turn the uh, calculation around, assuming we're not doing anything but absorbing 540 or however many students, and try to distribute across the case of 12, what would be the impact for the average classroom size? Something like that. Can yeah, so, maybe, yeah, so you have nine sections on average at, at Hawk. So you have 27 sections of first, second, third, nine sections of K, but remember they're half day, half day. Right, so, or it's, it's nine or eight, I believe it's nine. Um, so then you take, take the 200 approximate students coming and divide it by that, and you'll start seeing your grade level. So, you yeah, get a I, sense. I know you can probably do it in yeah. your head, but yeah. something like that, maybe yeah. just- We can play it up. To, yeah, just write it, you know, yeah. put it down, and then spreadsheet it. Sure. That'll help. Okay. Easy enough. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, is it possible to reconfigure the uh, schools? like what we did for the uh, uh, town center and also the this school village. Right. So, um, so the question uh, for the good of the group is, is there any other uh, configuration changes that we can make like town center and uh, Millstone River? And the answer is when we built this facility, we moved adults out of classrooms that were utilized uh, that for, for purposes for kids and then we repurposed the space back to being for kids by moving the adults to different locations. Some of it, most of it was here. Um, and so there's no other space like that left. Um, we might be able to take Mr. Salmastrelli's office for a small storage room, but besides, 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 besides that, there's not, there's not much available on grade level repurposing. Yeah, it's a good question. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that uh, brings us to our first opportunity of public comment. Fortunately, we did this before we had a vote to extend the meeting. Uh, the board invites thoughts and reactions on agenda items and items of concern from members of our community who are present. Each participant says to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement. And please hold your uh, statements to three minutes, or less. Thank you. I thought you were going to say hold your applause. Um, 
I have to give compliments to the um, uh, the outside, uh, to the gentleman who gave the report on the Arts Committee and also to the internal report. There's some really exciting things here, and it's one of the things, the arts program here, that does define, I believe, our district. Something a little funny to remember. Earth without art is death. <laughs> Secondly, um, I've said it before at the board meeting, and I, I do want to repeat it again. Having given 30 years of my life to the district, I do not want to live through the 1990s again. I'm a person who loves data. As a social studies teacher, I, that's my secret. I don't want to tell anybody. And data is important. But unfortunately, I think we've been dealt a hand that is unfair to us. And I believe at this point, we need to break down our responsibilities, but at the same point, play the hand that we've been given. So while we do look for more information, which is always good, I would urge the board to keep in mind, we cannot get behind the eight ball, because then we will live through the 1990s again. And I have the great opportunity to visit all of the schools, and I know all of the nooks and crannies in all of the buildings. There is no place at community where you could sneak and just speak with someone. Grover has no place. All the classrooms at North are used. All the classrooms at South are used. Wyckoff, the only reason Wyckoff has any space at all is because they were able to use the special services for their offices, and that's for adults and meeting spaces. If you look at every single building we have in this, in this district, Every single room is being used for the purposes of education. And Dave, I'd be more than happy for the greater good to live out of my briefcase. That's not a problem. <laughs> but I would really urge you, I know there are hard decisions to be made, and you do have to convince the community. But we've all come used to a certain standard of education here. And I will say it again and again ad nauseum. Let's not relive the 1990s in the district. I commend you on being for think, uh, thinking ahead of the game as opposed to being reactionary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Hello. It's a battery dying, so. Hi, Jenny Monsky, I'm from Red, West Windsor. Um, I have, I feel compelled just now to comment, as I have spoken to you more times than I can count at this point, um, about class size. About class size. There you go. Um, and so, I, in coming to your determination on what to build, where to build, I ask you as a parent and a former representative of several different PTAs to be aware of how that affects our children especially at the lower grades. I am a graduate, my family is a graduate of Hawk, so I am not currently there. But those classes were at capacity when we were there, certainly at Millstone, we're not talking about it today. But um, please be aware, please, sure. please be aware, please be sensitive when you're looking at the data you have and any data that you will be receiving, that as parents, class size especially, in the K-5 setting, where children are in the same class all day long, they're not getting up and going to another class where maybe there is less students, period by period. K-5, I believe, and I know that there's parents in this district who believe with me that we have to ensure that we are not overcrowding those classrooms. And so if there's a capacity question, and whatever data you have, I'm asking you to please be very sensitive to that and representing our families. And what it is that they want, they're in there, they're in there all day long, and too many kids changes the experience. And that is a fact. Um, and you can ask any parent of a K-5 student. So thank you. Thank you. My comment, the Warbler Way, West Windsor. I have two of the 35 kids on Warbler Way that was just on the spreadsheet. I wanted to elaborate on what she was saying because I can even tell you the difference between my two children. My son was in kindergarten at Dutch Bank, he's second grade now. It's in kindergarten two years ago at Dutchman. His class size in kindergarten was 21 at the time. My daughter's in kindergarten now. Her class size is 16 right now just for her kindergarten. 
I can see the difference in the edge like the attention that she gets versus the attention just, just with five kids. You know, a five kid difference. And in an elementary school level, a lower class size really makes a large difference. It really does. And the second thing I wanted to say is when I went to school, I went to school, like we had trailers when they were doing the construction. I don't think I really learned anything with the noise, the heat, like it's just not a good learning environment. So thank you. Thank you. Linda Jeevers from the Northern Grove uh, Prison Junction. Uh, tonight's presentation, uh, um, you know, schools capacity, is that going to be on the district website or can, can someone send me a copy? I'll get distribution to the Township Council um, administrators on our side for the Township. Keep on top of this and also if, uh, anything new from Howard Hughes, I don't know whether they've given anything new to the township or our land use manager or anyone else uh, but if they're changing um, the size of units the bedroom sizes additional and this is going to bring, bring on even more growth then we will um, appreciate any any type of data that you can share with us because it seems to be evolving week by week so I appreciate that and uh, I, I know with many young parents you're concerned about classroom size Absolutely, that is so so critical. So I hear you. I have three daughters who went through the school system K-12, and they got excellent education. And they're doing great in college. Um, so I, I hear you. I know. Have, have faith and trust in your superintendent and your school board members that you elect, because um, I, I know that that's always a big concern. So I hear you as a former school board member and, and as a community leader, council member, and I know we hear you too. So. Stay involved and um, keep coming out to the meetings. Right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jane Prue. I'm a high school South art teacher. Um, and I'll keep my comments very short and specific to the arts program. Uh, somebody had asked for some recommendations for classes. You said differentiation of classes. What does that mean? On a high school level, I've been here 15 years, and I teach uh, quite a range of classes, but what I don't see is any crossover between engineering and the arts, and I think that's a place that is absolutely necessary if we're going to move into the future of what our community needs. So arts and engineering um, and an arts lab or a maker studio via like TED-Ed and combining media is really essential to what we do. We also have woodworking in the middle school, but we have nothing that equals that kind of quality. In the high school, it drops off entirely, so woodworking and metalsmithing, these hands-on kinds of courses that are completely defunct at that level, except for one small sculpture class. So those are just some simple and direct recommendations for you. Um, and I also just want to piggyback on the National Art Honor Society conversation earlier. There was a mention of waiting classes. Um, I, Against that, I don't think that's really a helpful thing for our students, according to the whole child principle. Um, but the National Art Honor Society, as well as the Music Art Honor Society, excuse me, um, would offer opportunities for these students to excel in the ways that they understand excellence to be, um, but without putting that added pressure on an academic place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathleen Moriarty. Hi, my name is Kathleen Moriarty. I'm an aide taught in court in West Windsor. Um, having had kids go through Dutch Neck and seeing the lousy retrofit there, um, I have big concerns with retrofitting buildings. Um, Dutch Neck is known to have poor air quality, um, has, has been seen in prior studies, um, and to have rooms where young kids have their homeroom with no windows is a crime. So I will beg you, uh, when you begin to start assessing the options for retrofit, to please consider the health of the whole child um, and basic needs, basic uh, rights, which is to sunlight, to good air quality, 
um, and uh, probably you know existing other issues that sometimes get left behind when we're just looking at pure capacity. Um, so I do hope that people will consider and the um, you know different contractors will consider that. And uh, I would hope that someone would we look at Dutch Neck in terms of improving that. When you sit there and close a courtyard and give no windows to kids that are spending 90% of their time, particularly in the winter, in that room, a fluorescent light is pretty depressing. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Powell, 71 Cambridge Way, West Windsor. Um, so it's been brought to my attention that there is a first reading of policy 2460 on tonight's agenda. Um, I'm specifically concerned about item 18 in that policy, which is being changed. Uh, I believe the former policy allowed the use of electronic communications to um, submit requests to its district officials regarding referrals, identification, evaluation, classification, and provisions of a free, appropriate public education. Um, that section is being changed to actually forbid the use of electronic mail to make those kinds of requests. And I would ask what the purpose is, if the, if the, um, purpose, the purpose of the district is to provide the best possible education to every child, how is restricting the use of electronic communication to make requests going to be helpful as far as facilitating communication between parents and the district? Um, you know, I, the, by removing the use of electronics, it's going to impair communication, uh, I don't know if the intent is to have it be having people send regular aid, regular mail or um, leave voicemails on phones, but that's just going to be, I believe, unhelpful. And I would just question what's the reasoning behind changing that policy and if it really is in the best interest of the children. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Powell, just to address that, we'll look into that further. These uh, policies were all changed as per a mandate from the State Department of Education. Um, this is not a district-initiated change to these policies, so we will double-check that through Strauss SMA and through what was sent through through the state. Um, but we have a mandate to have these policies all changed um, no later than May. Um, in fact, the Department of Ed sent it out requiring it done by this month um, and did not allow us enough time to even get the policies. Um, but every policy that's in the 2000 section that you see on tonight's agenda comes directly from Stress SMA through a, a very specific mandate that we need to sign and tell the Department of Ed we've made these required changes. So um, I'll, I want to learn about that myself, so we will look into that more. understand the concern. Anyone else? Okay, that brings us uh, to committee reports. Uh, we'll start with administration and facilities. The administration and facilities committee met on Tuesday, March 21st. Um, for the third meeting in a row, we uh, welcomed George Duffy, our architect, to our meeting, and we got a little preview of what you saw tonight specifically focusing on um, planning for future home growth. Uh, the committee then reviewed a number of policies that appear on tonight's agenda for the first reading. As part of the resolution of a recent case before the Office of Civil Rights, Policy 1511 Board of Education website accessibility was developed. This policy guides the district on the accessibility of the district website for individuals with disabilities. I'm going to follow up with what Gerard just said. We reviewed a series of policies that address special education. The New Jersey Department of Education, as he said, issued a memorandum in February highlighting revisions that need to be made to our policy manual to comply with amended special education code. Districts are required to adopt these amended policies and regulations and submit a statement of assurance to the county superintendent by May. So in order to comply, we are moving forward policies 2468, independent education evaluations, policy and regulation 2460, special education, regulation 2460.1, special education location, identification and referral, regulation 2460.8, special education free and appropriate public education, 2460.9 is the transition from early intervention programs to preschools programs, 2460.15, is in-service training needs for professional and paraprofessional staff. 
In addition, we looked at uh, Strauss SMA audit results and a number of policies were amended to reflect current district practice. Prior to coming to the committee, policies in the 3000 series, which deal with certified staff, and 4000 series, which deal with support staff, were reviewed by human resources, and policies in the 6000 series, which deal with finances, were reviewed by the assistant superintendent of finance. So moving forward tonight is policy 3215.2, employment of substitute teachers, policy 3144, certification of tenure charges, 3218, which is substance abuse, 4140, termination, 4431, New Jersey's family leave insurance program, 6220, budget preparation, 6311, contracts for goods and services funded by federal grants, 6362, contributions to board members and contract awards, 6424, emergency contracts, 6471, school district travel, 6472, tuition assistance, 6620, petty cash, 6740 reserve accounts, 6810 financial objectives, and 6820 financial reports. Uh, the administration shared information about a training program to include administrators, teachers, students assistants, counselors, and police for the prevention of heroin addiction facilitated by the Manchester Township Police Department. The district will host the training session, which is called Not Even Once, and then discuss the implementation of police facilitated training during 12th grade health classes starting in the fall. Finally, the committee has settled in on a recommendation for the 2018-19 calendar. This calendar will be shared with the full board, the superintendent's advisory council, and PTA presidents before it comes to a vote at our April 25th meeting. The next day and meeting will take place on Tuesday, April 18th. Thank you, any questions? Okay, yeah, that was um, while we follow up with policy 2460, would it be possible to table that until we get an answer to the, to the question? Well, we need two meetings, so this is the first meeting. Right. Right. So we can right. answer. Yeah. We'll have the it'll, meeting in our next board. It'll be settled by tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're the curriculum committee also met on Tuesday, March 21st. The first item we discussed was the administration of the park in the summer for those students who take and pass either Algebra 1, Algebra 2, or Geometry in the summer. We discussed the New Jersey Department of Education announcement of the summer testing window for park Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry exams for those students who take these courses in the Option 2 in the summer. Since the testing window co occurs before Option 2 testing in the district has completed, the district requested a later testing window. For the 2017-18 school year, any student who successfully completes option two in any of these three math courses will have to take the associated park exam in the fall administration window, which is at the end of November or beginning of December. The next agenda item was the final performing arts external report um, for the final performing arts program review. The, the committee reviewed this external report Many of the recommendations are similar to the recommendations in the previously reviewed internal report. We will discuss that there will be a formal presentation from both teams at tonight's board meeting. We reviewed the survey results from the February 17th staff in service day, and overwhelmingly the staff felt the day was productive and met their needs. We next, we next looked at the draft rationale for a shift in the language arts summer reading program. This rationale was, was completed by a group of district language arts teachers. The rationale based on research outlines an, up, an, an update to a program which will have more student choice and align with the shifts that have been happening instructionally related to the summer reading program throughout the year. We will, the committee will review a list of suggested titles at our April meeting. <coughs> we continue the discussion of the implementation of the dual language immersion program. The committee discussed possible, possible languages as well as a timeline for implementation. The committee reviewed the number of AP exams that will be administered this May and noted that there will be about 2,600 exams administered this year versus 2,275 last year. Due to this increase in the number of exams, the curriculum committee recommends the approval of the creation of two assistant coordinator positions, one at each high school, at a rate of $3,500 for 20 days. Money received from the testing fees will be used to cover this expense. 
The committee also recommends approval of the consultant C.H. Lopez Education Consulting, LLC, to serve as the external consultant to the K-12 Media Center Program Review at a cost of $12,500. The, cur the curriculum committee also recommends approval for three teachers to attend a one-week teacher college summer institute at Columbia University from June 26th to the 30th at a cost of $825 per person plus travel and to accept the proposal for, from Corwin for Jim Knight's instructional coaching beyond professional development. The cost of this program is $38,500 but will be split evenly between West Windsor Plainsboro and Rider University. The curriculum committee recommends acceptance of the 2017 Verizon Foundation Award in the amount of $5,000 to the robotics team. This award recognizes the team as the winner of the Verizon Innovative Learning App Challenge Best in State Award. We also recommend the acceptance of a donation of $1,286.45 from the Wyckoff PTA to be used to purchase document cameras at Wyckoff Elementary School. The committee also recommends approval of the disposal of 744 obsolete books from the High School South Media Center in accordance with regulations. The curriculum committee further recommends approval of several overnight trips, including the Science Bowl team to the National Oceanic Science Bowl in Oregon, paid for by the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, the Science Bowl team to the U.S. Department of Energy's National Science Bowl in Washington, D.C., paid for by the U.S. Department of Energy, and, and the Science Olympiad to Wright State University. All, all of these are for high school South. The um, middle school and high school future problem solvers will go to the University of Wisconsin at Lacrosse. Um, and the middle school and high school uh, National History Day students will go to um, College Park in Maryland. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, April 18th. Thank you. Any uh, curriculum questions? Thank you. I have a question about the summer reading program. Um, what does that involve? I mean, what is it that, what shifts have already been made about giving students choice about what to read? I, I just, this is the first I've heard of it, and I'm wondering how to do this. So in the actual curriculum during the school year, students have been giving increased amounts of choice in terms of the types of books that they're reading and the use of book clubs. It's been going on at the K-8 level for quite a while, but we've started in the high school to also provide more choice for students in terms of the books that they're reading instead of whole class novels being assigned to everyone. So a committee of teachers got together and is start uh, working to align the summer reading program to be in line with that same, with the research that shows that when students have choice, it increases their motivation and agency in terms of what they're reading and their desire to actually complete and not just do it because it's an assignment that the teacher assigned. Okay. Also, have a question about the dual language immersion program. What is that and how would it work? A dual language immersion program would be a voluntary program that, um, should the district move down that path, parents could opt or choose to attend all those students in that program. It's a program in which students would simultaneously study half of the day in English and half of the day in another language. And the goals of those programs are to develop uh, high levels of proficiency and literacy in both English and the other language. question is um, the Corwin for Jim Knight's instructional coaching, which costs thirty-eight thousand five hundred dollars. What is what is that coaching for, and what does he do? So, uh, so what does Jim Knight do? What is the program that would pay thirty-eight thousand five hundred dollars? Okay, so it's a, it would be a program to work with the teachers who do coaching within the district. So uh, those are the teacher resource specialist positions. And then uh, Jim Knight is a uh, recognized national expert on the nature of coaching. He uh, works out of the University of Kansas and has developed a series of resources and materials um, on coaching. Coaching for sports? No, no, no. Coaching staff. It's for instru uh, improvement of instruction. Any other questions? Finance? The Finance Committee met on March 21st along with everyone else. The committee reviewed the agenda items for tonight and supports them. This includes a resolution required by the accountability regulations concerning travel 
The district is required to set a maximum travel amount. Don't be concerned by the number. There is no expectation that we will experience that level of expenditure. Preparations for bond refunding this summer continue, and this board meeting includes the first reading of the bond ordinance. The committee reviewed and discussed the draft February report with the secretary. We also talked about the 2017-18 budget. General funds date is identical to a year ago. Um, the budget to budget increase for 2017-18 is 1.76%. This includes $5 million in tax relief from ex excess surplus. Um, the committee discussed capital reserve levels, which are at $20 million. In recent years, the district has used two and a half to six million in capital reserves a year for capital projects. A provisional list of projects worth doing in the district over the next few years totals over $40 million. In addition, we are looking at around 13 million for the Hawk uh, addition to accommodate growth. So we do have needs for the levels of our capital reserve. Um, other business, work continues concerning the termination of the district's transportation use of the Wells Road property, which is owned by the township. The district purchasing specialist has obtained a reduction in the per copy copier fee from 0 .0036 to 0 .0036 from 0 .0042, which appears to be a better rate than experienced by most districts and gets spots thumbs up. The state of New Jersey insists that the district pay tuition for two students attending an East Brunswick charter school, and this appears contrary to several provisions in the state of New Jersey charter school regulations, and we will be looking into that further. Thank you. Uh, any finance questions? Yes, I have a question on the maximum travel expenditure. Um, it, to date, the spending is 87558 and the maximum travel amount is $450,000. That seems a little out of whack. Are we expecting a lot of travel in the next two months? As Louisa mentioned, the number is a requirement, and it's one of those numbers that you can't go beyond. So the sensible thing is to pick a number you want. And the year to date shows you we have no intention of hitting 450, mm -hmm. but we also don't want to inadvertently be caught by trying to be short and say, oh, let's try to get to 90. There's there's nothing, we don't even budget 450. Oh, you don't? So okay. We have to give a number and not mm -hmm. violate that number. So what, what do you budget for travel? There's been very little change in that over the years, and I don't remember what the total number across the district has been budgeted um, by, uh, by, by school. Okay. But you can get a good flavor of it because at this point in time, I believe, Martin, most of the professional development travel. Yeah, most professional development travel has already taken place or has been approved by the board. That would happen by the end of June. I heard you say we spent 87000 today. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that somewhere around 100000 would be. Uh, but, Larry, just to, we don't budget it. If the number was 400, 500, it doesn't change anything in what we do. It's just the number to give the state. Well, you could imagine that suddenly it becomes imperative for some reason that we do a higher number. If it was so important to us, we could have budget transfers from other accounts to support it. But if we had picked a lower number in that annual meeting of the accountability regs, it wouldn't matter. We couldn't transfer the money. Okay. So this gives us flexibility. All right. It's just another application of a one-size-fits-all approach. Yes. The Department of Education and the Commissioner's regulations. That's really the origin of it. Okay. Any other finance questions? Okay. Now we'll go to administration. Uh, can I have a motion on items one to four plus the... Uh, the yellow addendum. Uh, Isaac and Carol. Any uh, questions on that? On these items, I have some questions on the uh, policies. Uh, I need an answer now, just to the question I had. Part of it comes from having a train ride can you but uh on uh 6362 that's contributions to board members and contract awards and like i 
that uh, as long as I can rise to the next meeting, this is this thinking that uh, by law, so I guess we have no choice in this, uh, no Board of Education will vote upon any award or, or any contract in the amount over 17000 to any business entity which has made a contribution reportable by the recipient and on the whatever to a member of the Board of Education in the preceding one year. What is that? What does that mean? Uh, what's a reportable contribution? Is that about nepotism or? It's, like I say, it's, I'm sorry, I normally would. Uh, I, think, I think it's the political. No, yeah, we asked the question. That's supposed to be submitted along with each. So. Right. And, and I don't want to talk about something now. We it's can a response to the accountability code. Right. It's part yes. of the yes. 6A23. Those are a whole series of things. So, 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 if, they, so if somebody makes a contribution to a board member's campaign or whatever, that entity cannot do business with the uh, board of ed? Is that the. In, in excess of the dollar amount that well, was set? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'll let that go. On. Yeah. If the, if the reportable contribution is made, uh, and they mean a campaign or a it, 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 exactly for a board members campaign, which would have to be reported to ELAT, uh, which is the New Jersey State Agency for that, the board could not award a contract to a vendor that had made a campaign contribution. Uh, if the amount of contract was more than seventeen thousand five hundred. Okay, and that it doesn't mean that that board member has to abstain. The board, well, the board can't the award contract. It, it basically precludes. It basically precludes vendors uh, from yeah. uh, financing the campaigns of board members in order to secure public contracts. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. The. Uh, the one on school district travel, is that going to change today in any way we do business now? Uh, again, I'll tell you what, I'll put that in, uh, I'll put this in an email and we can, we can answer at the committee meetings rather than keep us here. All right, uh, were there any other administration questions? Mr. Chen? Yes. Sir? Yes. Ms. Ho? Yes. Ms. Julianne? Yes. Ms. Kru? Yes. Ms. Wise Yes. Mr. Taylor John? Mr. Stephanow, maybe the rest. Okay. Ms. Cage? Yes. Mr. Fire? Yes. 801. Okay, curriculum. Uh, we have a motion on items 1 to 10. YZ and Dana. Any uh, curriculum questions? Uh, yes, sir? Yes. Ms. Ho? Yes. Ms. Juliana? Yes. Ms. Crew? Yes. Mr. Mike B. John? Yes. Mr. Chandler John? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Ms. Cage? Yes. Mr. Fuller? Yes. Yes. Okay, finance. Uh, I have a motion on 1 to 18. And the green addendum changes numbers eight and nine. Uh, Taylor and Rachel. And the minor correction to number. Oh. Yeah, okay. The amount will be from fifty-seven thousand one forty-nine. Correct total is fifty thousand four hundred. Okay. Item fifteen. The. Uh, the final sentence in there, the final annual adjusted cost is fifty thousand four hundred ninety nine. Any questions on the finance? Yes. 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 Personnel. I have a motion on the one personnel item plus the blue addendum. Do you have a second? 
You only have one person over there tonight. One person. Okay. Uh, Terrible noisy. Any questions on the personnel? Ms. Juliana? Yes. 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 Dr. James Looney is a science teacher at High School North and is retiring after 18 years with the district and a uh, much longer time in the education field, as I understand. So I uh, want to thank him not only for his plan, but for his workplace health, his work, uh, and enjoy his retirement. Okay, approval of the minutes. Can I have a motion on the uh, on the minutes on the table, uh, Michelle and Louisa. Any questions on the minutes? Aye. Those in favor of approving say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, any ways on reports? New business? Uh, this brings us to the second opportunity of public comment. Again, Scott Powell, 71 Cambridge Way. Um, a little bit more about the construction. You know, based on the timeline that we saw this evening, it looks like the board's going to have to make a decision either next month or maybe May at the latest if we're going to get something built in time for the 2019 school year. So while I am definitely an advocate of judicious building and ensuring that the administration is making the best use of our facilities, I would encourage the board not to be um, slow down too much by looking for the perfect formula for exactly how we can be using our spaces. Um, I'm sure that there, the administration would benefit from some appropriate questioning by the board about are we using our facilities to the best of their capacity. For example, the one comment Dr. Adderall made about town center using classrooms that are designed for 25 people, having four to eight students in special education. You know, as we build new classrooms, might we get away with smaller classrooms that could have us four to eight students rather than 25 student classrooms with four to eight students. So I think the administration would benefit from the board asking good questions about how they plan to build this space, um, but don't let that slow you down from making important decisions to ensure that we continue to have a high quality education in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Lowry, 824 West Windsor. Um, I understand that, um, from what was being stated by Mr. Dalton, that um, these regulations are required or they're being pushed by the Department of Ed. However, I guess it begs a lot of questions. There's a lot of parents that were very surprised to see these uh, regulations coming through. There was no information, as far as we were aware, um, either through parent advisory or the special education PTSA group to be able to uh, you know, let parents know that these were coming around um, and to at least be able to discuss them. Um, so I think this begs kind of a question that's been moving um, as to when is the next special education program review. Um, I know there's been, I have asked, I know based on the parents asking me when this would occur. Um, I understand that there's been interim superintendent or special services supervisors, um, but at this point, it looks like we have a permanent one. Um, and I think the issue uh, that was at the last program review, which was over four years ago, I believe in 2012, um, had really brought to the forefront the issues of uh, difficulty and the absence of, of adequate communication between parents and the administration. Um, and from that, a lot of frustration. Um, and from that can come, uh, you know, a lot of litigation or needless delays. Uh, and I think we all want and we can all benefit, the district and parents and families and the students from getting a more open communication. Uh, so I would leave that question still open uh, when the special ed parent, you know, uh, program review may come around now that we have a permanent supervisor 
um, and so that you can start uh, reflecting upon has there been what improvements have been made and getting again the feedback of the parents perhaps in light of some of these policies um, I think now I'm sure parents will want to go back to um, some of these agencies and ask them and put them to task as to why are these being blanketly um, accepted by school districts or being pushed to be accepted by school districts. And now that we're aware of them, we can go to the New Jersey School Boards Associations or we can go to the county commissioners and start pressing them. But when we're not aware of them and they're just being submitted with very little knowledge, parents are being taken aback and not really understanding and maybe misunderstanding. So um, we do hope that maybe there'll be a program review coming around for what's going on in the district, but we would also um, you know, like to until then be able to get a little bit more open communication of things that are this dramatic um, occurring uh, at least a little bit quicker in terms of communication to the parents. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I just want to add that the uh, uh, policies you say, uh, I don't know if you use the word pushed on the school districts, required by the school districts to test. So, but the other thing is that with any of the policies, there are two there are two readings before they're enacted. So, oh, absolutely. So <laughs> we'll be uh, I guess our next meeting is April twenty fifth. So, but it'll probably be on the agenda for that one unless something. Oh, I'm sure. Right. So, well, but yeah, uh, there'll be time to discuss. But uh, but it, yeah. it also now uh, now enable the parents to have a better understanding yeah. of these going through looking at other districts that have accepted them. I'm sure there's exceptions to a lot of things that can occur when policies are brought in, um, and to see if those are options. So, but right now, we didn't know. You know. I don't know what other districts are doing, but I understand these are mandatory, so. Uh. Yeah, right now, we've heard that Strauss has may have been doing that, but not all districts have adopted these. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, and why West are very quick to do it. Yes. So. <laughs> they have to adopt them by May. Um, Every district in the state has to adopt them by May. So it, this is, you know, at least enough for parents to yes. be able to, as I said, go up the channels. But if we're not aware of this, I, I and we, one would like, again, the open communication was the issue. Okay, and, okay thank you. Thanks. Just for the good of the room, we've got to there, it was a requirement for a memorandum of understanding, and it was originally due to um, the U.S. Department of Education. Right. And next week, uh, school districts push back because the model policies which are still released within the last month. So there's no way to do a first meeting <laughs> within our structure, and then they moved into my home city meeting and I'm meeting with her. It, it is it's first week of May. First week of May. So that, that will allow us to do first reading, ask questions, second reading, but we have to bring forward first reading, so we really have to compliance deadline because it does require two readings for adoption. So there are good questions that have been asked, and we'll have to be heard as well say we'll follow up. And we uh, wish you some good questions tomorrow. <laughs> And Mr. President, just just one point, just a clarification. Just just I, I, I noticed it a little while ago, but just just for purposes of clarity in the minutes, uh, with respect to the, uh, the the closed session uh, agenda, uh, in addition to the matters identified on, on the, uh, the agenda that was available, uh, the board also to discuss uh, items within number four, uh, specifically potential contract negotiations with Mercer County Community College, and possible sidebar agreement with the WWPEA. With respect to number seven, the board did discuss uh, an issue with the NJSIAA, as well as docket numbers L00530 and L52617. So those are the specific matters that the board did discuss. So uh, I just did notice that they just weren't going down the agenda. Okay. Okay, any more public comment? Thank you. Can I have the motion to adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> Rachel and Isaac. Uh, and everybody else. Uh, those before we're joining, say aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. <laughs>